Welcome to Happily Ever Aftermath, the podcast where we discuss relationships in movies and our relationships with them. I'm Plea Grinbaum. And I'm Diana Rojax Connor. Hello, Diana. Polina, I understand that you have a really big announcement to make. Yeah, I do. Um, so I've been, I have been doing this podcast for over, we've, over three years, and it's been amazing. I've met people, I just had no idea they would be this cool. Um, I've been lucky enough to have friends as uh, as guests and as listeners who's who have given us amazing feedback and um, most of all I have gotten really 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 close to my co-star we barely really knew each other when we started this podcast like we definitely met and we're like here we are uh, like we just instant <laughs> I don't know I felt like an instant affinity towards you and I felt like I knew because I knew, you know, uh, I worked so closely with uh, our producer and your husband. Um, we had a quick bond. We did have a quick bond. And but I think it's time for me to step away from co-hosting this uh, podcast. And um, it's with a heavy heart and it's been a really difficult decision. But, you know, I think I've said uh, kind of what, you know, I, I've explored kind of what I've needed to explore. And, um, I just think it's time to step away. Um, and it's just difficult because it's been such a huge and fun part of my life. And the thing that's made it such a huge and fun part of my life is my co-star and, uh, and my, and the listeners, really and having being a part of this uh, you know this amazing podcasting community I had no idea um it's I anyone who's thinking about doing a podcast it's the you will find the warmest most open-hearted people so I mean yourself included oh thank you Polina this this podcast was not possible without you it was something that played in the back of my head and when I mentioned it to you, you did not hesitate for a second of, you have to do this. <laughs> and then you were the driving force of like, well, Polina said so. So <laughs> wait a minute. Wait, no. Do you want to, do you want to do this with me? Yes. <laughs> oh, and, and yeah, I just talked about our entire podcast origin story in about 14 seconds yeah and that so. was pretty much it it was not yeah <laughs> yeah I think it was yeah it's something I always wanted to do I worked for a podcasting company and I'm such a big podcast fan but then there we are yeah here it is look what we did I know it's been amazing mm. um, yeah. but I hope that you keep it going I mean so it's funny because I, I you already know that I'm going to continue but this isn't about <laughs> This isn't about what I plan to do in the future. Right now, this is about this saga <laughs> is is no longer uh, infinite, but right now it's uh, it's been an amazing three years. Um, so many episodes that I I don't have the count in front of me. No. And thank you for introducing me to all of these movies. And no, thank you for some of the ones you did that weren't the best, but... <laughs> same, same, but... <laughs> you're, hey, you're welcome. Uh, but it was, it was incredible. Yeah. And it still is incredible that just because we're not doing a podcast together, that doesn't mean anything is, you know, ending. No. It's no. just evolving. It's evolving, yeah. Well, thank you, because I, I feel the same. Like, it's... Uh, you... I think you, 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 you said this, that it's watching movies is one thing, but talking about movies is really the, the hobby. And I think like that, I definitely felt there were movies that I 
hate it. And then I realized that the it, they were the ones that I just was like, oh, this is awful. I just am not enjoying this at all. But they were the ones that were the most fun to talk about. Please don't list the titles, but thank no, you. No, I won't. I won't. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and it was also, yeah, it was, uh, it, yeah, it was really good. Yeah. And, and it was good part- because we did it together. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, p- Pro tip, find a really good podcast partner. I Don't mean, do it alone. I mean, and for those of you who do it alone, just put a mirror up. Yeah. Yeah. Same. Same set. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for doing this with me, Polina. Oh, thank you. I'm so glad we did it together. It was, it was really seamless and amazing. I'm going to yeah. miss. I'm, I know I'm going to have so much FOMO. Oh, well. And that, that's. That's, you know, I will be having guests in the future. Oh, really? Huh. Uh-huh. So I'm, um, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm just saying, like, I've done a couple podcasts in the past. I mean, maybe I could, like, be a guest or something. I don't know. I, I, I mean, like, kind of busy, but, like, I'll, 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 I'll consider it. Uh, that's great. That's, like, all. I'm, I mean, I've been on a podcast or two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got I your mean, number. I got yeah, your number. Okay, great. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Okay. I mean, you know, any time. Um, really. <laughs> Wow, that was cheesy. (laughs) (laughs) Hello, Diana. Lena, is it a problem if I watch Zardoz instead of Xanadu? I don't know. That kind of depends on when you watch Zardoz and how much you like Olivia Newton-John. Okay, so I think I'm okay. All right, good. Um, So today we're talking about Xanadu. Um from uh uh 1980 and uh but you know you can't just watch the i can't do xanadu justice diana like this was a big part of my life and i just can't do it justice it's too big so i had to bring in one per the only other person who understands really understands this movie and understands it in a way i i can't even grasp which is my friend Robin, who is our guest, our special guest this time. Welcome, Robin. Welcome. Hello. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited. Oh, long time listener, first time uh, joiner. Excellent. Um, that's what we <laughs> like to hear. So one of the things that um, so actually Xanadu um, Xanadu is is the reason um, that uh, I met Robin. Actually, what? Okay. Yeah. The story it's, has already started. It's a huge part of our origin story. And Robin's one of my closest friends. And uh, especially during this time has just been like a friggin' rock. And um, basically, I used to work with her roommate. Okay. And early on, one day I walked into his office and he goes, At, what'd you do last night? In that way that people ask you when they just really want you to ask them what they did last night. Oh, that's a thing. Go yeah. on. And he's like, well, so I, I bought this gigantic fan off of Craigslist. And the minute my roommate saw it, she ran, she basically ran into her room, got on roller skates, put her hair in pigtails, put on like, a, you know, a, 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 an appropriate outfit for this and lip sync Xanadu. And I was like, sitting there across from him going, I need to meet this woman. I need to meet this woman. I need to meet this woman right now. Can we just leave work at like nine o'clock and meet this woman? And then I did. So uh, it was everything I thought it would be. So I need to make sure I'm getting the details correctly. Was this like a box fan and you needed it to have your like hair swaying or did I hear this incorrectly? So here's what happened. Uh, Don comes home and he was always one of those like, you know, uh, Craigslist hunters. You know, if uh, Craigslist didn't exist, he'd probably be on a on a beach with a metal detector or something, you know, always okay. looking for treasure. And so he's very excited. He got this fan. It was one of those just heat spells like we've had now, but in the city where you don't have air conditioning. And you can't tell by the picture online. Okay. And he gets home. This fan is massive. It's a ah. standing fan with, you know, the round on top. It's probably... I don't know, five feet tall, maybe. And on it, it says patent. So we started calling it the general. 
And he turns wow. it on and it blows air at you. This is what, 2005, I guess, because that's yeah. when we met. So uh, it blows all of this, you know, uh, air at you and your hair flies backwards. And I just immediately was like, hold on. Did not do pigtails because your hair went into flying pigtails. But when mm-hmm. got my oh, you're skates, right. right? Um, put on something flowy, put <laughs> put on Xanadu, and then yes, proceeded to, and as you know why now, Diana, because they're, you know, her hair's, you know, kind of flowing at the end. And then I did the entire ending dance number, which I knew pretty well. You know, there's still pieces <gasps> I'm missing, but it's not like Olivia Newton John and the choreography is great for her. So yeah, mm-hmm. I was able to do it. And the best part is it was a Tuesday. So when he comes yeah. in and asks, you know, what did you do last it's Wednesday? Like, it was Tuesday. I ate soup. I don't know. I um, probably yeah, did eat sweet. soup. That actually is probably pretty accurate. <laughs> I probably did come home and eat some soup. Whoa. So he came home and he's like, she wants to meet you. And she says, she says, I have to meet this woman. We're going to be best friends. And I thought, anyone who is that excited by this, we probably are going to be great friends. And then I think he had a poker night and had you over. If I'm yes, remembering. That might have been the first one. No, was that not after? Anyway, it's, yeah. It, yeah. That might have been or after. Something. But yeah. We're in a poker. Yeah, we had this like poker night thing going for a little while. Oh. Yeah. This is like the ultimate friend origin story. Very nice. Very nice. Yep. So when she wanted me to come on, it's like, what movie? It just, and we talked about this for years, having me come mm-hmm. on. And then yep. we had something else picked out. And I said, oh my God, you know what movie it has to be? It has to be our origin story movie. So I'm very excited. So this is very special for me. Oh, and here we are. We're so talking let- to do. Let me, um, so to talk in Xanadu, let me um, read the description. Um, this is from Google. Um, Struggling artist Sonny Malone, Michael Beck, is trapped in a dull job painting album covers. He is instantly attracted to Kira, Olivia Newton-John, ah! an anonymous woman randomly photographed in the background of one of his assignments, but no one is able to identify her. Visiting the auditorium where the cover was shot, Sonny finds a mysterious beauty, an ageless Greek muse, who encourages him to team up with old-fashioned Danny McGuire, Gene Kelly, to build a roller skating disco. So there are a few problems with this description, um, one of which is that she wasn't randomly photographed in the background. She was prominently featured. Okay. (laughs) Um, But... And it, it was, I, I, I don't know if it was always going to be a roller disco, but it did seem like just dis- like uh, roller skating, roller skating was, you know, going to be a big part of uh, life at Xanadu, the club that they do. But I just want to say this is so crazy because this movie has both Olivia Newton-John and Gene Kelly, and you know how big of a crush I have on Gene Kelly. So a crush Robin shares, so. Yeah. Oh, okay. Robin has uh, affirmatived that. So mm-hmm. this is all accurate information that Polina is doing right now. So Robin, it when is. did you first see this movie? And of course, I, we, we have to ask, what format did you see it in? You know, I was trying to remember because I have seen Xanadu so many times over the years, but I was little, so it had to have been in the theater. You know, and I would assume if I saw it in the theater, it must have been original release because... I doubt that theaters were putting on, you know, repeat special screenings of the, you know, tire fire that is Zama do. <laughs> and yeah. so that's I mean, my thought. I mean, not like now where I'm sure that there are screenings of Xanadu, but it had to go right. through this evolution of uh, finding the correct audience to appreciate it. Yeah. 27% of Rotten Tomatoes, my friend. Um, well, I mean, it's yeah. not always right. I am shocked it got 20. I'm shocked it got 20. <laughs> um yeah uh so did you watch it like how often like was were there when you would read because I'm kind of the same I I I know I didn't see it in a theater um for the first the first I don't think I've ever seen it in a theater um because I just don't I don't know this wouldn't be the kind of movie my parents took me to and then and we had just came to the U.S. in 1980 when it came out um, and, and, you know, my parents are kind of movie snobs. Um, so I definitely saw it for the first time on video and then VHS at friends houses. So mm. this, this was definitely a slumber party 
staple for me. Um, really? Yes. And it was on TV. And yeah. And we didn't have cable. So I remember when, you know, when they, had, they gave you like a week of free cable once a year. Um, I remember. Uh, I remember like being really excited that Xanadu was on and like planning my, you know, week around Xanadu being on you know, like I showtime. Might, I might have seen it on TV because I was thinking, I know I didn't see it on VHS, but it's one of those things that's like asking someone, you know, do you remember the first time you, you know, ate cake? No, because you've done it so much. That's yeah. kind of where I'm at. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately with Xanadu. So I would say theater or, um, when it aired on TV. It makes sense that you would have seen it later because you're just like, you're like a few years older than me. And I also mm -hmm. like a lot of it was that I came, you know, like, because yeah, 1980 was when I was like traveling and finally came to the US. So, you know, it was just kind of a crazy year. Here's my follow up question for you, Robin. It's kind of like absorbed in your psyche. I understand that. That's kind of like Star Wars for me. I just always Star Wars was and there was mm -hmm. no shock. It was just like I watched this so many times. It's not until years later I realized the consequences of certain things happening. But <laughs> well, here's what I want to know. Um, when did you ever own a copy, if ever? Mm. So I did have it on DVD for a while, okay. but I wouldn't go and watch all of Xanadu. I had it purely for exactly that end scene, you know, and more like you have to watch this craziness, just like I have, um, some strange, like deep cut, you know, drag queen videos, or I have the Karen Carpenter story done with Barbie dolls. Mm. I also had, oh yeah. Oh, I love that Todd Solon's movie. Well, okay, wait, okay. I just realized you and I have never watched that together. Why? Well, it's pretty heavy. It's you really, know, when you actually you're right. go to watch it. You're right. It's a little, it's a little intense. Have you ever seen that? What's weird is that I had to figure out what the hell you meant when you said that. And then when she said Todd Solon's, I'm like, oh, I got it. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> it, I don't know exactly what that is, but the fact that those two pieces fell together, it made sense. It's amazing, but it is. It's intense. It's a little heavy. Well, that, that well, it's it's Karen Carpenter. That's yeah. automatically a pretty heavy. I mean, I had yeah. a, my friend Aaron, big fan of Carpenter's. In fact, I kind of want to listen to some music now just by like, you know, you say one thing, all it takes is for me to go like, yeah. I should listen to that. <laughs> I should listen to that. Okay, so no problem. So I kind of get that. As you get older, you you absorbed it and the in the younger years, but it's just like, awesome, I now own it. And then it just, it's it'll be there for you when you need it. But it's not necessarily something that you reach out for. And oh, are there- exactly. exactly. So other than that, and you were saying you don't put like, are there other circumstances under which you would watch this movie? No, zero. It's pretty much for camp effect or to like, be like, you have to watch this. Yeah. <laughs> like I'll give you a couple examples. Um, I have mm -hmm. a friend who um, I was out to dinner with he and his husband and I said something about Xanadu and I sent him the last dance scene off YouTube and he wrote to me, I hate you. I've watched this six times in a row and I can't stop. <laughs> mm -hmm. So maybe that's my role in life to introduce Xanadu to, to everyone. I, I was so excited to do Xanadu, not just because it's our origin story, but I've said to Felina probably 10 times, I'm so happy we're making Diana watch this. It's even <laughs> in my notes. I'm so, yeah, exactly that. I'm like, I can't wait to watch Diana just lose it about the ridiculousness that is Xanadu. So yeah. Yeah, what was your experience with it, Diana? So uh, I have a podcast, and I was <laughs> assigned it from our guest. And it, you know what's really funny is that this is not – this. I, I am aware of the existence of Xanadu, but it's never really – I'm just like, huh, Olivia Newton-John and something about roller disco? And that's like the extent of what I know. So when I put it on, I'm like, oh, this is actually watching Xanadu. And for some reason, this is not real, but this is what I think the soundtrack of Xanadu is. Xanadu. Is that right? Is that accurate? I don't know if that's accurate. Yes. Oh, I don't know how that's possible. It, it, it's, in, it's in my skin, and I've never really seen it before. Hmm. And what that's about the magic, magic of Xanadu. 
It is. Oh, geez. From the magic of Highlander to the magic of Xanadu. <laughs> I take you on a journey, girl. That's my I, job. I'm enjoying this journey. So oh, good. So far. Don't push it. <laughs> oh. Ooh, plans. Plans. After, Polina's after, making plans. I love this. After three years. Don't push it, Polina. <laughs> yeah. No, that's um, kind of- Yeah. So, yeah. Um, Diana, any sort of thoughts? Like... As you went, so so you didn't. You knew that there was roller skating, and you right. knew that there was a Livy Newton John. Yep, yep. And and I was trying to think like, I could very if this has got me at a different point in my life, this could very easily be something that I would have on for the sake of listening to the soundtrack through the movie. Never buying the soundtrack, but like, hey, I managed to get this off of when it was on TBS or something. I will put this on. And then I can listen to it as I'm cleaning my closet because my head will be in the closet. But it doesn't matter because I have the scenes memorized in my head. <laughs> that is mm-hmm. what Xanadu is. It's an opportunity for you to listen to something. And some of it is just like the sound effects. Like if you've never seen it before and your back is turned to it, what the hell was that sound? Brrr. Oh, right. I forgot the sound of the 1980s. I don't know what that was. <laughs> but it's, it's like it's bright. It's interesting. That first scene where the muses come to life, I was I was enjoying myself. I'm like, just awesome. Okay, cool. Do it. I love dance numbers. Go for it. Wow, this way gonna... you like dance numbers? You know this. You know but I you, I thought you, know you, you enjoy musicals. Oh, but it's when they're strung together. No, no. Once again. I enjoy musically inclined movies. Now, this is a musical, of course. Mm-hmm. The people are singing and something is happening. But what have I told you about how much I enjoy wonderfully choreographed scenes? That you know, is true. Scenes. That is true. And also... Which, which Xanadu does not have wonderfully choreographed scenes. But, you know. But you know what it did have, Polina? A montage. It definitely had a montage. I love montages. Montage. So and it had a montage with Gene Kelly. Dressing montage. I think it might be the first montage. Oh, hang I on. mean, I'm curious because think, I haven't done any research on this. No, me neither. But it's 1980. The musical montage of trying on clothes is known to be an 80s trope. Yep. Okay. See, that's an interesting thing. So, so are you true. Saying, so this it, could be the first montage. No, 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 no. no. You can't call it the first montage. No. That, the first musical wacky uh dressing room modeling clothes outfit change to pop music montage see i heard what you said and i knew you can't say this is the first montage i'm just like i'm pretty sure there's a workout montage and rocky from you know 1970 something but when you said the changing of the clothes to music Mm -hmm. yep yeah i'm writing it down you're right it's thank you for for making that more precise it is true yeah yeah, I, I got. I you, make Robin. no claims that that's the case, but if it is, how hilarious is it that throwing Gene Kelly in a dressing room and putting a bunch of random outfits on it spawned all of these that we saw during our teen years? Oh my God! Yeah, the 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 changing clothes montage is probably the reason it takes me so long to get dressed because I that is that is how I learned. <laughs> about getting dressed it's like you put on music and then you try on very different clothes do you have two friends to look at you and just kind of shake their head oh when it's the wrong outfit well you know imaginary friends yes oh okay i was about to say is that what you married sean you need somebody to you know shake their head does not have the patience oh i'm sorry i thought you meant right now two friends to shake their heads and look at her like (laughs) (laughs) i'm like oh yeah no that is what i have right now but not when i'm getting dressed i just imagine you two doing this shaking your head no this does explain your closet though it does doesn't it um i do love a costume um so yeah i so okay so you so you absorb this i was I kind of forgot how huge of an Olivia Newton-John fan I was. I, okay, I have a question. Yeah. <laughs> what? Well, that's the question, <laughs> I assume. <laughs> okay, I, I, you got to remember, so I was seven when this movie came out. I probably saw it when I was eight or nine. And Olivia Newton-John, just to me, perso- you know, there was Grease. 
Yes. Okay. All right. So I'm waiting. It's like strictly Xanadu or it's like, I'm listening. Okay. No, it's the whole thing. It was her music that I loved. It was, it was also like, this is, you know, music videos were just starting. And, you know, I think, you know, there was so many hours spent at my friend's houses because we didn't have cable. Okay. Like watching um, music videos. And like, to me, I was like, she just seemed so like glamorous and sort of like, um, exactly who I wanted to be. And I'm sure this is like, hori- I mean, it's horrific to me now about I, how, like, yeah. How, did Robin, did you have the same thing? Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, Olivia Newton-John has that kind of, she's very pretty, you know, good bone structure, the singing that has this naivete in, in the roles that she kind of plays here. She's mm-hmm. trying to be a little bit more cheeky, but, and just this kind of, pretty and almost girlfriend like but without like a sexual undertone which I think for little girls is just so appealing and accessible though I read the Roger Ebert review here's how he describes her Olivia Newton John is a great looking woman brimming with high spirits (laughs) I know I read the same thing Um, but yeah there's just something kind of not innocent but very wholesome about her and so I think as a young girl it's like that's what being grown up is you know I'm going to be pretty and wear flowy things and yeah, sing and in roller skates she also seems very like she was having fun you know I could see that like she had a lot of energy and there was something about her music that was so ridiculously catchy and she was everywhere everywhere and it, it was like, you know, just, yeah. And I think for little girls, yeah, the wholesome thing. I, I kind of, Robin, I think you, you definitely hit it there. So here's a follow-up question for that. You've got the relationship of Sonny and Kira, but there's also kind of like the side thing. Polina, I know that you had the Gene Kelly crush, but when you're watching Xanadu, how does that come into conflict at all? Did you have anything towards Sonny? Were you just like, I want to be Olivia Newton-John? Hey, Gene Kelly's pretty cool, even though he's like older. Which actually, he looked, he was fantastic. Oh, so good. Um, I mean, anyone who can pull off this is like, I mean, I have more respect for Gene Kelly now than I even had before. But um, I, um, yeah, definitely. I mean, first off, like, yeah, floppy hair. I mean, you know. <laughs> Come on. Which um, one? Olivia Newton-John no, or Sonny? Son, well, both, both. Um, I, yeah, I definitely like, and I think as I did see it when I was younger, I don't think it was like a full on cry, but it was more like, I was like, that's the kind of boyfriend I want to have. He has floppy hair and he's creative. The Robin, how about you? What was your Oh, thing? not at all. I remember, <laughs> well, he's kind of the poor man Sandy Gibb. Yes. Um, well, the but I remember hair. seeing it when I was little, and we'll talk about this later about how my opinion of Sonny has done a 180 from an adult viewpoint. Yeah, but I right. thought he was funny, but I just saw him more as like a, I don't know, this is a weird word to use, but like this, you know, uh, little mischievous scamp. You know, he's, you know, mm-hmm. striking back at his boss. He wants to run off and skate, but I didn't view him. At the when the movie came out, I was nine, and I think I viewed him as too immature <laughs> to be more Even at nine, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, don't think he like, I was the one who watched Eight is Enough, and oh, yes. Nicholas, I thought was a big baby, the one who was my age. I wanted oh, to date sweet. David, the like oldest brother who had a job at his own apartment. <laughs> This is why Robin and I are friends. Yes, exactly. (laughs) Because I forgot who he was completely. And when I saw it, it was more, I was like, um, I was like, he has floppy hair and he's artistic. Like, Mm -hmm. what I mean by that is I was like, check. But it was more for me, it was more of an Olivia Newton-John fulfillment, being a Olivia Newton-John fulfillment fantasy. And also I was really obsessed with like Greek and Roman mythology at the time. Which didn't really help the situation, I'm sure. You yeah. can on something that's always driven me nuts, though. Why yeah. is she named Kira? There's oh my a muse of music. There's a muse of art. Like, all these, were they worried, like, they couldn't clear the rights with a muse? Like, it just, it <laughs> drives me nuts. Yeah. Kira? I mean, what if they had it and then the entire set started to crumble, so they just fixed it in post? Like, <laughs> no, no, not not you, not you. Uh, Kira. Yeah. Kira. Yeah. That's fantastic. You're Kira now. 
Yeah, were they worried I mean, about they, being smited? Exactly. Exactly. And they could have had fun with it. Like, I think it's Talia is the muse of comedy. Like, oh, right. we're not going to make her the mu muse of music, you know, or we're going to make her the one of comedy, which we're filming. They could have done something, but they picked like some random generic name. But yeah, maybe it was the smiting. If they didn't have, you know, smiting insurance in their, in their writer, that would be tough. I mean, they could have tried to have smiting insurance, but basically, uh, you know, the production companies like, you know, we don't want to pay the extra, you know, thousand dollars a day for the smiting insurance. I mean, it could have been, you want Gene Kelly? Do you want smite insurance? <laughs> uh, find Gene Kelly. Uh, All right. So although they did mention Zeus, but I guess he wasn't rendered. He was rendered voice only. So yeah. I guess we'll let it slide on this. But that still drives me bonkers for no no good reason. It shouldn't. No, impact it's, it's ins I, it made me insane then. Even I was like, yeah. Oh, well, and also it's just like they were played out like the, I assume it was meant to be Zeus and Hera, but like, mm -hmm. are the muses the daughters of Zeus and Hera or is that one of his many, many affairs? Oh, you know what? I don't think they're the, I know they're, I know they're his daughters, but I didn't yeah. know that. I, I don't think, think it's with Hera. Or like a parent thing. Yeah, exactly. So I'm just listening to, it's just like, oh, you too. And it's like, what's it? Okay, this is not the Greek mythology that I learned, but if we're going to play it this way, I'm going to oh. assume that's okay. Whatever. That's, I guess it's not that important. Okay, I'm also trying to imagine you both as how much did roller skating come no, in? No, he, it's, he's not. I forgot. I totally forgot. What's uh, happening? It was somebody else. It was, um, it was, I cannot say her name. It's uh, Manusas. Like, um, like and Medusa's I, so I think it's. Daughter? Yeah, the muses are Manuses. I can never say it. It's M N E U S E S, as I recall. I just closed the the browser tab, but now I remember. Yeah. Oh, okay, anyway, well, doesn't I'll matter. See. They obviously <laughs> didn't care enough. How how much roller skating did you both do in the time of Xanadu? Okay, I'm going to confess something shameful. Polina has been mean to me over the years about this, mm -hmm. but I do not know how to ride a bike. Okay. I roller skated everywhere. Woo! I taught myself to roller skate when I was seven, I think. And even up to like 13, 14, you know, until you started to have friends that had cars or you had other ways of getting around. I roller skated everywhere. We lived, when I was 10, we moved to El Dorado Hills and it's very hilly up there, hence the name. And I would zoom up and down hills and it was just my mode of transportation. So you can imagine my utter delight seeing this movie the first time with okay. roller skating okay so, now um, the so much question. roller skating not as much as robin so much roller skating okay like the roller skating was a huge part of the structure of uh of you know mid 80s social life interesting and so early like, early to mid 80s birthday. social life at 70s, in 1979 i had an eighth birthday party at a roller rink with a cake with a roller skating girl on the cake and i thought this is it. I've achieved peak awesomeness. Like there's, <laughs> there's nowhere else to go, but up peak to date. Now it ended up not being true, but it um, <laughs> thank God, actually, that would oh. be, <laughs> it just never got any better. It never got any better than, than the giant cookie cake with a raw, with a, actually, it's funny. My eighth birthday, okay. I had a peak. I was, I had a Chuck E. Cheese birthday and they finally, my mother every year would try to get them to write my my name in Cyrillic on the cake. Mm -hmm. And I got one of those giant cookies, you know, one of the like big cake size, you know, cookies from Mrs. Fields. Yep. And they that was the year that they finally wrote my name in Cyrillic. So my mother was happy. I was at Chuck E. Cheese. I did have a, a bunch of roller skating birthdays after, but that was my... Wow. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to imagine like how we can get a roller skate on a cake to Robin right now to make this year <gasps> be peak. Mm, why didn't we do that for your birthday? Shit. What? Why birthday? Just, just Friday. Wednesday. Friday. No, Friday's already awesome. Wednesday. Have a cake. I think that might swap you out, Polina. Hey, Diana, how you doing? You looking for some friends? I mean, you want to oh, hang out? <laughs> 
Now, here comes my shame. I Woo! did ride a bike when I was younger, but I have, you, you know that expression, it's like riding a bike? Crap. Because I tried again, can't do it. So we can, we can, sh Plena, shame. Shame for shaming. Shame for shaming. <laughs> I said one thing once, I was extremely drunk. I don't think I've spent years shaming, <laughs> shaming Robin. What I love about this is basically it's Robin's, Robin's way face. of loving is to tease you mercilessly. <laughs> and so I find it hysterical that one time I was drunk and I was a little out of hand about... No, that was the big time. But there's the years of, it's not that hard. You could learn if you wanted to. <laughs> oh my God, I had no idea that I was... I had no idea that I've, I've created so much shame around it. Your friendship um, is powerful, Polina. You say the littlest thing. We're just going to be holding our knees and rocking back and forth. But Polina says it's easy. But Polina says that musicals are fun. Okay, I just want to say that this... this <laughs> how Robin and our relationship goes I was in a boot like you know one of those cam boots and I was trying to get out of a Wait, I was trying to get out of a bad story this is a we we both are bad all right go yeah. ahead so I'm trying to get out and I kind of messed it up somehow and I was trying to like hold the door I don't know something happened and I kind of I fall and Robin instead of being like oh are you okay let me pick you up she just starts laughing. I mean, that is not true. She did okay. not fall. She's at her house. I hope this is the kind of stuff you edit out. And it was no. the house <laughs> on Upper Market in the hill. It was it, like I saw her fall down. No, it's a it's a hill. So that she's is... trying to open the door. But when you try to open the door or keep the door open because it's on a slant, it keeps trying to close on her. So she's having to hold it, but she's in the boot. And she does this low slide, like watching somebody slide downstairs out of the car. Oh, and that's I it. Yeah. I knew I ended up on the ground. And so she's like, I wish she said, I didn't go hold, hold open the door, but that's different from someone falling out of a cab in a boot onto their knees. But, but she's just watching her do this slow. <laughs> she just watches me and it just starts <laughs> laughing. To be fair. Yes, it's true. But... I yeah. mean, so then it's like, and and the, so the like, good. maybe I feel or make her feel a little bit of shame. About it. Anyway, I don't um, know. I mean, how much so shame good. can you get a free meal out of that shame? I don't know. Uh, Robin is very generous with, so yeah, but <laughs> Robin is very generous with shame. <laughs> <laughs> so generous with the shame. There is so much shame. Also um, good. Also good. Anyway, uh, but um, I just want to say that rewatching this movie was, I knew it would be insane, but it's more insane than even I remember, which I didn't think was possible. What was I have a it? question for Diane. Oh, yeah. Me, yes. How, uh, what were your emotions watching this movie? Like, I pictured you like analyzing this factually couldn't happen being like alternately delighted and enraged and bored. And I'm wondering what it was like. <laughs> okay. Uh, so in the beginning, it was kind of interesting because I'm just like, okay, a little bit of music, the guy's drawing and I'm just like, Oh, how many instances are we going to watch him get mad at himself? Because it's not what I want to draw. Not what I want to draw. I'm like, mm -hmm. I get, I get it. You're disappointed it's okay and then when it kind of you know he ripped up the pages and threw them out i'm like okay that's littering what are you doing but it had to be for the sake of the next scene so i was on it and then again that's when it kind of went through and the muses came and it's only looking back on it now i'm just like oh of course for some reason i took that as like independent things of just like he's upset because but of course that was meant to be something that was that was the call of the muses but I was too busy being floored by the fact that all of these like really awesome women were coming out of the screen. And it, while it was 80s cheese-tastic, it wasn't ridiculous. I'm just like, oh, okay. Hmm. The message has been received. This is what this movie is. All right, let's go. And mm -hmm. here's the thing though. This is what I was, I was actually just kind of pondering here. You're talking about like, different you know what the hell is this to this to that to boredom i will say that towards the end it was just like oh we're just gonna keep going huh okay <laughs> <laughs> dance sequence dance sequence oh okay oh you kept going 
oh, there's another one. I mean, it's it's really cool and all, but like, are we going to just keep watching the roller disco have all of these people who are not Olivia Newton-John just, oh, I guess we are. Okay. Yes. Oh, yes, we are. That just kept going. And then I wanted to, and then I started to think about, I want to meet these people. I want to know what it was like to be on the set of Xanadu. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. I have no, something for you. I'm listening. So there is a writer, Hillary Carlip, and she did a book. It didn't get wide publishing. I think I have it on the Kindle. And it's a series of stories of her growing up, just, you know, normal suburban kid in L.A., but she... It, because it was the 70s, she did all kinds, and I'm getting to a point, she did all kinds of things like she and her friend would go to the Troubadour as teenagers, and they ended up meeting like Ooh. Carol King and Carly Simon, like when they were starting out, and then they would get their mom to drop them off in um, Laurel Canyon and try to find like where all these folks lived and stuff. Well, anyway, she took up juggling. And then she put like an ad in the paper of like, and ended up teaching people to juggle for movies and stuff. And then she ended up getting a job she does a whole story or whole chapter you know one of her like short stories on getting a job as one of the jugglers on xanadu she had an affair with one of the female dancers what and she talks there's not enough of like the xanadu on set but there is some so i'll see if i can find i don't i don't know if i'll be able to find the book online itself but i'll see if if not, I'll just take pictures of those pieces. And so I can give you the gift of hearing from someone what it was like working on that crazy set. All right. Oh, I have, Robin. I, have, I had no idea why, why do I, not, why have I not read this book? Okay. So here's my next follow-up question. We'll link to it in the show notes. Where was there a juggler in Xanadu? I missed it. In that long end dance sequence. Okay. I suppose. There's so much stuff going. And there's jugglers. Okay. Like uh, juggling bowling pins. Yep. Oh. And they skate under them. Right. Oh. Yeah. I was too busy looking at everything else that was happening on the screen. And and how did all these people show up? And why are they all wearing the same outfit? I also was wondering, what exactly is the revenue model? Of <laughs> oh, my God. Yes. Thank yes. you. Oh, my God. This was such a big part of our conversation. We saw this together on Saturday. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I could do one episode just on the end dance scene. Okay. Like, Mm -hmm. for example, there is a big safety protocols. There is a huge fountain in the middle with water going out, people sitting on, like, tile, then a ring of roller skating, then more people sitting, then more roller skating. You have water, multiple layers of people. Yeah. Sean kept asking, where's the bar? How are they making any money? Mm-hmm. All of these people, nobody has a drink in their they hand. Work there? Are they part of clubs? Is it a cult? I don't know. <laughs> Were they? Yeah, yeah. I, I was just wondering. I'm just like, are they employees? Are they entertainers? Are they independent contractors? Are they people who like, you know, in other '80s movies when they go to proms and they all have this weird choreographed dance scene, but they're all high school students? Is this like these are all people who decided to go to a roller disco on a Friday night, but then at the same time they also are wonderfully choreographed rollo- roller disco dancers that well, also came in coordinated outfits. didn't exist in the 80s and there just wasn't a lot else to do. Um, but no, but this was the other thing is we kept thinking like the only way that they could all be dressed all the same like that is if they were employees, right? Because they would be in a uniform. And then, but it wouldn't make sense to have like that many employees means that you had no, like who are they serving? Like, where are the people? The other thing is, their tr- like all of their equipment was incredibly like they had trays at one point, and the trays were insane. They were tiny, they were square, they were lucite. They did not have a. Clean <laughs> that like, issue with the trays. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, if you ever work in service and you work in a bar, like a high volume bar, mm-hmm. the the like tray situation's really crucial. It matters. Oh. I meant and to how ask are they going to put the cash saying, for drinks? They're they not round. No... What? The trays aren't round. The what trays... What makes a round tray more helpful than a square tray? You could because drinks are uh, because you can fit more drinks. Drinks are circular. Oh, right, right. Okay. Um, and yeah, and then you can fit different sizes of them, whereas a square has to go on a grid. Plus, they were just tiny. Like, it was ridiculous. How could you make it through a place that big with four? You couldn't even serve an entire table. Can if like, you're on roller skates. 
No, <laughs> because that tray would not hold four drinks with waters, not even four regular drinks. There's going to be one person. So, I mean, I'm sorry. These people are not making money. Yeah. Are, are so we my sure? other favorite Polina rant mm. was when, <laughs> when the tray rant is so good and I'm so glad I got her going again. My other favorite Polina rant was there was a point where they're out doing, I don't know, whatever their date stuff, you know, Andy, Gibb and Kara. And at one point they <laughs> start man, flying man. and she goes, why is she, she should be the one flying. She has magical powers. Why is he the one flying? I'm like, well, she's a muse. So she must have inspired the flight. She's like, that doesn't make any sense and got very. I was very angry. <laughs> My God, you you're a few right. moments like that. The tray, the, but yeah, it really upset me. And um, I was just like this. I, it just doesn't make any sense. She needs to like. He like, first off, why would he believe he can fly? Like, because he's with she her. She needs to start. None of this. Makes I sense. believe there's an entire song that says, I believe I can fly. <laughs> right in Xanadu, but no, no, in no that was really. later. It was yeah. 1980. No one felt confident about their flying skills. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I'm making shit up. I don't know. I was very outraged at the time. Okay, it's hard. Um, yeah, the other, uh, another like weird thing is I real I had actually a revelation about Gene Kelly while watching this movie. Yeah, and here's the revelation, because we've watched a couple Gene Kelly movies, or, well, I have. we watched one for the podcast. Mm -hmm. um, and I was like, oh, watching him dance is like, and the choreography was so bad. Like, honestly, like, I think we had better choreography in, like, summer camp. Um, but, like, the choreography, but, like, watching Gene Kelly dance is, like, what it feels like when you're dancing. Well, that freedom, that sense of looseness, that being in your body, that kind of power, it's really amazing. Um, and that's what I real. I was like, what is it about watching Gene Kelly dance? There's like a muscularity, but it's also like watching him dance is what it feels like when you're dancing well. I mean, he's got talent and skill like watching anyone do anything that they have mastered no yeah. but it's like you know it's like you know when you when you when you're dancing like as a as a what like when i am dancing and i'm somewhere and i'm not thinking i'm just kind of in the moment just moving my body and it feels really good it it that's what gene kelly like it's not just that he dances well, but it's like what that feels like. That freedom. You're part of that flow. That, that being in flow. the zone. You, yeah. you feel it. Because I've watched a lot of other people dance and they mm -hmm. don't feel that way. Uh, I, I think what, what you're describing, if I'm, if I'm reading it correctly, he exudes something that translates to our own movements. Is that what it is? Yeah, I think it's more that like he, yeah, that freedom that he has in his body mm -hmm. is the is when you're dancing the freedom that you feel. So watching, or that I feel. Oh, okay, watching him do that and and knowing that you know it was the last movie that he was in, um, it made me think of the movie Out to Sea, which was a Jack Lemmon, Walter Matthau later mm -hmm. in life movie, but. They played dance hosts, and the guy who played Cosmo is in that movie as well as one of the other dance hosts. And there's a small period where he's dancing in there, and it actually, like, the movie takes the time to focus on him doing it, and it's really sweet. And I'm just like, mm. that, I want to be so good at something and still be able to do it, you know, in the, yes. you know, the Your later years of my life to where it's still being celebrated. So, mm -hmm. so you can, you can talk about the, you know, bad choreography or however you want to put it plana shame i had a good time shame. oh i mean that's no shame it's still fun to watch it's an, um, it was interesting. gene kelly's dancing is amazing and and it's funny watching him i thought to your point diane about having something you're so good at at an older age i think mm -hmm. he was 58 at this we looked it up mm -hmm. um was he 58 or 68 one like, of the two maybe 68. yeah one of the two and I, yeah, I think he was a little older. I, I think, think he was 68. He was yeah. 68. And 
Olivia Newton John is young. She's in her, you know, probably early 30s at the time. And you can see that she's not a strong dancer and that he's when they did the one of them in the you know like he's remembering the 40s yep and they're dancing together and it is so obvious that they've had to really simplify it for her and he's moving very slowly for her and i thought what an amazing place to be in to be almost 70 you know doing mm-hmm. something like this and it's like slowing it down for the young one like it's yeah. just it's amazing and then in later in the film when he actually dances on his own Mm-hmm. And you get to see that he's still, it's just, he's mm. so liquid and, you know, mm. has this very casual, relaxing thing about it. I have the same emotional reaction, Pauline. That's a little different one just because yeah, I'm not course. a good dancer. But <laughs> to me, it feels like that thing, like when you're first dating someone and it's clicking and it's oh, just flowing and you yes. get that little happy skip. That's what I feel like when I watch him dance. I'm like, oh, it's just everything clicks. It's so good. Yes. Yeah, I I, that's Real. the same. I think it's the same kind of feeling. Oh, I, wow. I know exactly what you mean. Different descriptions, but at the same time, I felt both of them. Good. Nice. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I just, I need to just take a moment uh, for Gene Kelly. Um, but yeah. And, and there, there are so many like really, it's funny, especially because it's such an early 80s movie. So a lot of the things that we think of, like, you know, when there's 80s night or, you know, aren't it, it's not that right because it's 1980 and so they're still like in the in the um clothes like those super kind of loose like robin and we're, we're just like the super loose those kind of flowy dresses that were like dance inspired were such a big thing i wanted them so bad um there's uh the colors are all there but like they're not the super um, like primary colors, you know, of later eighties, mm. there isn't as many harsh angles, you know, and even the makeup is like still more dewy and kind of natural. Like there isn't like the severity of the way the body is, was like, you know, was kind of dressed later in the eighties where um, like with the big shoulder pads with like, you know, um, uh, just it, that that wasn't there. It was still like that holder from the seventies, and like yeah, the the aesthetic is like ridiculous. And there's these crazy crazy moments, like you know they have a rose in the, you know at some point it's glittery. Mm. <laughs> it's like why <laughs> there are these weird touches. Robin, did you have that too? Like the clothes was that a big part of it for you as well? Yes, I had the same um, reaction to the clothes, and you know for decades we put these you know, false markers, Mm -hmm. you know, of, you know, time and years and calendar dates. And so we think of the 80s being something and the 70s being something, but, you know, life is not that binary. It doesn't just have a cutoff and switch. And so you have this bleed between decades, especially you see it in things like music, art, clothing, makeup. And so what you see here is that kind of leaving that softer, you know, kind of 70s, but you have the flowiness, you have the softer colors, where I thought, ah, this is where we see the 80s coming in was the end Mm -hmm. um, with the, you know, the roller disco, because you started to see where they push into some of that 80s territory or when they did the, the rock band, but it was kind of off. And then when she puts on that outfit where Um, it's kind of, I think it's when she first comes up on Xanadu and she has the crazy headpiece and the netty makeup. And then she ends up in the leopard outfit later with the big hair. And you start to see where they're starting to explore, um, the horrors that will be (laughs) some of the, it feels like they dove into kind of the worst of the eighties at the very beginning of the eighties. But there were so many outfits that I remember, like, it was funny, like rewatching it. I was so like, I was like, I remember being obsessed with like, uh, especially at the end, she wears a couple pantsuits um, that, like, uh, I wanted so bad. Like, I, to me, like, if I was a woman who got to be at a, like, got to go to a roller disco, like, on a Friday um, that my boyfriend owned, I would have, like, that's, it's, that's success, man. If I had that, like, black and, you know, the... Uh, the gold trim, uh, the gold trim uh, pantsuit. Oh, jumpsuit, jumpsuits. Sorry. I was gonna say because these weren't pantsuits. These no, were it was like a jumpsuit. strapless, shiny, low cut numbers. Oh yeah, they were a jumpsuit. They was full on. Yeah, like 
halter. I think it was a, one was a halter top. Yeah, I want yeah. all of it. Um, and the shoes start getting really 80. Yeah, the rock band was great. And then, of course, this is the other rant that I had, which is that, you know, they do this thing where they go from the 40s into the, like, do mm -hmm. 40s, 80s. Yeah. And at one point, because it's like Gene Kelly's um, vision of this, uh, you know, nightclub. Club. Yeah. And um and Sonny Malone's version. Mm -hmm. Um in their heads, like their forties clothes were so ridiculously inaccurate. It was bugging the F out of me. Like so and so many details that were completely unnecessary, like they could have easily done it. Like there was so much fabric. And of course, in the 40s, like famously, you just didn't have like fabric because it was being used to like it was it was all being channeled, you know, to uh, it was all being channeled for the war effort. So that's why silhouettes were really narrow. Mm, OK, and that's so... why in the 50s with like Dior and the new look like when that's why it was called the new look because it was suddenly all of this fabric and it was sort of about like um it was basically about moving out of the war you know of wartime and into you know freedom and pleasure and um you know uh especially well more definitely more so in the u.s but like yeah so i don't know i that just drove me nuts but okay square trays fabric 40s outfits and floppy hair anything else yes and the one does not get inspired by a muse to fly one is flown by a muse ah. yes. i'm done according to polina yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay flying and various square trays types <laughs> complaints aside i would like to know in terms of we'll say you know sunny kira relationship we got to watch it all come up on screen. When did they fall in love? I can go. Oh, okay. I think that they fell in love when, well, so for him, I don't know that it ever, yeah, I would say, okay, I'm going to say what I think about their love. But first, I think when it happened was for, for Kira was when, they were doing the dress Jean Kelly up montage because her whole thing is about, look, I just come in, I, you know, bewitch these men, I inspire them, I move on. And when I see them, you know, 40 years later, I pretend I don't remember them. And for her to actually become attached enough with someone to want to stay. And it was clear she was having so much fun and they're laughing. And she was like, oh, I like this, you know, instead of just being off and inspiring and be it as at a remove, she was kind of part of the fun. And part of the creativity. And as she said, I was only supposed to be here to make Xanadu happen. But she found herself kind of wanting to stay and carry it further. For him, I don't know that when it starts like that, if I have to find this woman, like, did he ever really, or will he ever really get to know her? Or for me, it felt like he just stayed in infatuation. I don't know that I ever saw him move out of that. Mm. No, you're, it, it could be like kind of a, a commentary on on the acting of Mr. What was it, Michael Beck? Mr. Beck, yes. Mr. Beck, yeah. Uh, yeah, I did think that there was something kind of a little bit like, okay, when, when you're surrounded by Olivia Newton-John and Gene Kelly and also the sets around you, it's really difficult to be, I, I guess he's, is he the, is he like the straight man, I guess? It's like he's the one to mm. try to, I mean, not with that hair, never mind. He, I don't think he mm -hmm. can be the straight man with that hair. But uh, I, I kind of, I kind of get what you're saying, Robin, but I think it, for me, it was the next level of just like in the performance of that. It's like, you can't, you can't do much when you have Olivia Newton-John on one side and Gene Kelly on the other. You know, it wasn't his performance. It was more like if I'm actually looking at these characters in a movie mm -hmm. that he just takes everything she says as a given. It's like, but I'm amused. He's like, okay, whatever, stay. Like he just was kind of like you're so I'm like how does he not think there's a gas leak or that she's insane or like when he when mm -hmm. he suddenly put somewhere else and it just felt like he was I even put in my notes I'm like someone stuck in the sex haze like it just <laughs> felt wow. like you know he was just kind of swept along or even the piece of Kalina you were talking about where you know his whole thing and where he's like you know sticking it to the man and he wants to be able to be an artist and 
all of a sudden now she's like, you should just open a nightclub. And he's like, okay. And that is the furthest thing doing operations for a nightclub, a really weird nightclub is like the <laughs> furthest you can get from like pursuing your own art. So that's mm-hmm. why I felt like he was just in this infatuation. Wow. No, mm. great observation on that one. Mm. Yeah, I, you know, I kind of had the same, like, I have a real, I had a really hard time pinpointing when she fell in love. Like, I feel like, yeah, I feel like love, I mean, she had a lot more to lose, right? Like, she actually, like, you know, I kind of agree with you that, like, his stakes were really low, mm-hmm. um, you know, for falling in love. And, um, you know, like he, but she was basically like leaving her life, you know, as a muse, which is, you know, she's been doing for a long time and she's leaving her sisters and she's leaving her family. So I agree with Robin that I think, you know, I think it's a quote unquote love at first sight, but I just, I felt like he never really also wanted to know that I mean, I guess he tried to find out something about her Mm -hmm. and she's like, you know, no questions, but I don't know. It never really seemed genuine. So maybe that is his acting. I don't know. But I do feel like he, um, but I think for her, I I agree with you, but I would actually, I think it kind of, um, I wonder if there was something in it where she actually sees Gene Kelly again. And she realizes, like, kind of learns something about how, he, you know, humans can feel about love and how you can, like, you know, have these feelings for a long time. And I think that in a way she realized, you know, I don't really know how to explain this, actually, which is weird because I'm trying to talk about it on a podcast. But um, I feel like it, like... I think that seeing seeing like Gene Kelly look at her made her realize that that is how she feels about my, about Michael Beck. I mean, I'm sorry about Sonny Malone. Mm. And I don't know why I just keep calling him Sonny Malone. It's just fun to say. Um, but uh, it's I like I think that, you know, sometimes it's like you have all these feelings, you have all these feelings, you have all these thoughts, you put them in, you sort of attach them to different things and then. I don't know. This is my experience of falling in love, at least. And one day, it all just kind of, it all fits together, right? And so I feel like when she saw Gene Kelly and she saw, like, that he still loved this woman or still thought about her, Mm -hmm. and she realized, like, oh, wait, that's going to be Sunny, but also that's me. You know, I'm going to miss this person, basically. And, um, yeah, that's what I think. How about you, Diana? Uh, so, really thinking about what you and Robin were saying, like, Robin really hit it on the head where she's like, this guy's in an infatuation stage. And I was thinking he fell from her from the beginning. He fell in love with her on an album cover. So... It's like you saying infatuation stage. It's just like it just didn't crystallize until you said it out loud. So it's kind of interesting. And I agree with you. So when he saw her, you know, and went looking for her. And I think it stayed as it was because you're right. It's just like, yeah, whatever you want. And yeah, he kind of like. When she left, he tried to collide into a wall just to be with her. It's like, I believe what you say. I'm going to skate into a wall. Hey, it worked. Whoa. So. Exactly. It's just, it's like, I guess I'm trying to get caught up in the wonder of it. But at the same time, it's like, I'm not getting enough from him. But I'm getting kind of, again, this movie feels like everything else that's happening around it and the relationship just also happens to be there. It's like, hey, I'm going to inspire you. Oh, shit, I fell in love with you. It's like, she wasn't prepared for it either, but it's like, she yeah, she didn't get the script mm-hmm. either. It's like, oh, shoot, I should have been putting this nuance in through the rest of this that I was falling in love with you. Um, but we're here now. 
and we've already used up all of this tape, so I never thought I'd fall in love with you. Wait, are you <laughs> sure I'm not supposed to fall in love with Danny McGuire? <laughs> You're looking at him, right? He's over there. <laughs> he's kind of awesome. Oh, him? Okay. And yeah, he's got I, a much nicer house. Yeah, it's like, if anything, I would be disappointed that it's just like, oh, this is possible. Where were you 40 years ago? I want to stay with this one. He's got talent. He's got pizzazz. He's got, uh, I guess I can love this one. Okay. Uh, I'm in love with him. Dad, will you let me, please? I don't know. I guess I guess I just wasn't into them as much as I was into everything else that they were giving us in this movie. So, um, much like the muse, is, yeah, the muse is able to exude all of this out. And I think I'm wondering if, like, kind of like how you were seeing what happened with Danny. I wonder if she just kind of burned herself out, and she's just decided that she wants to retire the musing with just this last guy that she was able to get something out of and still be tied to Ooh. Danny at the same time. You know, except at the end, mm. she goes and acts like she's leaving and then comes back as one of the waitresses and pretends she doesn't know him. Yeah, I, I wasn't exactly Is she sure. a sociopath? Was, so there- I couldn't figure this out and I actually read the wick. Like, I was really confused by the end. The only thing I can think of is basically she goes away and then she has to come back as a person, like as a human. <gasps> Oh, and does she know who she is? Yeah, I was wondering. I don't know. So I don't know. And, and you know, I don't know. And it's that's the only thing I can think of. Oh, my God. Robin's like, <laughs> Robin was like, her brain is going. I mean, it is kind of upsetting for a movie you've watched for decades and then have somebody point something out to you. It's like, what? Oh. I don't know. If well, this it is would true actually because... make it much more interesting because... What I took from it was all these years was she's kind of nuts. Like if you fight so hard, you know, which like I would not expect a Greek or Roman God to be super sane, you know, so we know that, you know, yeah. kind of mercurial tendencies are part of it. Right. But um, for her to be like, please, I've got to go. I've got to go. I've got to be with him. And then they say, OK, maybe a moment, maybe forever. And they send her back. And then she suddenly there is a waitress and is like, oh. You don't know, you know, pretending that sh- that um, she's not Kira like she did with Danny and kind of messing with them. I'm like, it, it, my God, it's been 14 seconds and you already have to mess with them. But if part of the deal was we've got to kind of, you know, blank you out, make it a tabula rasa and you come down as a person and then that makes it a little more interesting. It's kind of a weird balance of power now that he knows their whole history. And, right. you know, I guess it. the and- assumption is that. Yeah. You know. And and the thing is that you can't the pro, like it is weird cuz what you know what's he going to do like explain to her that um explain to her that she like you know well you were amused before and you were was roller skating you know like how could like yeah it's You know a, what she'd have to know who she is because yes. otherwise it'd be like who is who are my parents? Yes. You know, what's my story? You know, like, I think that she would probably have to know. And so she's having cheeky fun with it. Like, I'm Belinda now or whatever name, you know, she has. Or or does she actually wipe his memory? That's the other option. Uh, Oh, right. Maybe. But he was sad and then he lit up when she turned around. So, oh, my gosh, wait, I've got a theory. Okay. There were originally 10 muses, but then when she came back, Zeus had to wipe her from history before and present. And that's why we don't know about the muse Kira. What? Oh. Oh. (laughs) Whoa. And that's why, like, she's not the muse of something specific. Well, she's obviously the muse of opening up um, nightclub venues. (laughs) <laughs> I mean, if you if you really think about it, did the real life Kira inspire this movie to get the reality of the story out? But but does Whoa. Kira does Kira know how to do that? And in turn, she's actually accidentally doing it, and it's just like mm-hmm. coming out in fits and spurts, and that's why it's Xanadu and not like you know a different movie. 
Oh my God. This is, yeah, this is, I feel like I need to like <laughs> walk this through the entire, I need to rewatch this movie with this idea. Cause you're kind of blowing my mind right now. Yeah. Cause it's true. He would have to. Cause well, how do you explain? I don't know. I well, like, maybe I like Zeus's it. final gift to her. You know, yes. they inspire her sisters, inspire some screenwriter and they're like, well, <laughs> you know, she can't be known as one of the muses, but you know, we can bring together this wonderful marriage of disco and roller skating that will clearly endure forever. They were wrong. On <laughs> yes. That. And, and, um, you know, a sort of bad understanding of, uh, you know, the 40s if, and 50s musicals. What if one of the other muses was just really mad that she left? And she said, fuck you, Kira. This oh, movie's about you. That's it. That's, that's it. it. That's, that's it. it. That's it. Oh, That's it. Man. There's no other explanation. Her, all shit. her sisters were mad. The, there are two of them. The muse of music and comedy were like, screw you, Kara. Oh, my God. That actually does make a lot of sense because how angry would you? It, it, I actually thought that as it was happening. Dad, I want to go. Oh, okay, you can go. And then the other ones are just like, wait, what? I, can I talk about my like actual real love story over here? Mm-hmm. Hello? I yeah, and also we're immortal beings, and you're just gone forever. No goodbye. Mm -hmm. You yeah. meet some floppy-haired dude in a vest who's terrible at his job, by the way. Right. And yeah. This is what you do, and you leave us and forever. Not that. Yeah, and like not really a very compelling personality. Isn't you know? There's just not a lot that like. Yeah, if I was gonna leave the musing game, I, I don't know. I just feel like I would want to go out with a bang, you know. You don't want to go out on this guy who like a nightclub that, you know, may, you know, struggle for 10 years. And then, you know, I'm not like 10 years is generous for that. Oh, I'm being very That's generous. Roller disco. <laughs> I am being extremely generous. OK, um, I have to ask, though. Right. He is an artist. What happens if she becomes between him and his art? That happened. He's running a nightclub now. Mm -hmm. First of all, I don't think he was that into his art. This drove yeah. me crazy. Yeah. His day job. It's not like his day job is like, you know, he's, you know, a futures trader working, you know, Hong Kong hours and everything's insane. He actually works replicating album covers, which we can talk about the weirdness of that. How many yeah. do they need to stock all these record stores? Oh, yeah. yeah. The logistics of that was but blowing my mind. Literally and clearly does not have a great work ethic with his last one in, first one out. So he could be like paintbrush down, everybody goes home, and then he gets to stay in the office, free studio, working on fine art all the time. This idea that like you can only do one or the other when you have the most cush job ever makes no sense to me. Oh right. yeah. And and the job um is like as you said, it's not a futures trader. He, it's clearly like quite casual, um, mm -hmm. you know, both in like design and he gets to work on his technique because every oh. album cover is really different. And so there's a lot of like really good practice and, and, and it's not like it's killing your creed. I mean, maybe it is, I don't know, but like, yeah, it's not like, oh, I, I work 12 hours a day doing something completely different, like, and here are all these creative people, the space, um, he gets to meet musicians, like, I don't know, it's, mm -hmm. yeah, it was an, is a whiny is, little bitch. Okay, oh, oh, that Sorry. was not, not even pulling yeah. a punch there, Polina just said it, she went straight <laughs> to the heart of it. All right, so here's, here's my, here's my next question. We've got all this speculation of what exactly happened in the end. But whether or not we take what we said and ran with it or not, what do you think actually happens next? Do these Robin, crazy, do go these first crazy or... kids, what are these crazy kids doing? Or you want to go last? You well, get to it's interesting because our talking is changing some of it. So. Ah, welcome. So, mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. So we know he's a terrible employee, like the way that he treated his boss and Evidence. everything. I mean, Right. Terrible yeah, employee, speaks. you know, quitting all the time, um, you know, refusing to do the art properly, um, which people wouldn't even know what record to buy. Well, anyway, so what I see with him is kind of a 
And then he goes off to run this nightclub. So he doesn't seem like anyone who sticks to one thing for very long. And so I think once the reality of like running the roller disco comes into play, like having to do fountain maintenance, having to deal with all those broken trays, (laughs) you know, having to, um, I don't know if those were like groups and clubs of patrons or people that all work there, but there's a lot, a lot going on in that place Mm -hmm. that he would, um, end up kind of growing tired of it. But I think when I thought that she still knew who she was and still, you know, was like just amused kind of hanging out, though I think you're right playing about going into a person. I thought that she would keep messing with him and drive him slowly insane until he, you know, just kind of <laughs> killed himself because he went nuts. Wow. Um, so I now with, <laughs> But now with both, I think you're right with that she's human. I think she still has to kind of know who she is. Um, maybe she doesn't, but regardless of whether each of them knows who they are or not, it's clear that it's saying they're going to have an attraction. They're going to move forward. I think that the monotony of like a real grown up day to day life is going to drive him nuts. And I think he's, he's going to come up with all these different ventures that, um, when Sheen Kelly's character, Danny, mm-hmm. Danny McGuire, mm-hmm. Danny McGuire, Danny McGuire clearly does spends his money on weird things like harps and, you know, these mansions with what he thinks are the trappings of a rich person and hiring a 20 something with no experience to open a very expensive nightclub for him. So I think he's going to not with bad intentions, but continually grip Danny for one wacky, crazy scheme dream after another. And I just hope that Danny has enough money to keep it going. And I think that Kira is going to, very over time lose respect for this and um, end up leaving him. So I hope that she doesn't know that she's a muse because that would be really hard to realize you gave this up for kind of this, you know, sad sack of a guy. Um, But she's a looker, you know, she can sing. So I think she'll, you know, find herself a great husband, but I do not see these two making it. And I think at some point Danny passes away, but he did not leave his money to, um, to Sonny. And so then Sonny's got to figure out what he does next. Maybe that's when he actually buckles down and like focuses on a job and gets serious about his art. I don't know. Mm. It's not a great ending in my mind. Oh, no. Uh, Okay. Mine isn't either. Uh, Mine is. um, So I basically think, so she's human now and she's, you know, she's a waitress. And at first you know, it's great. Um, she gets to, you know, I'm going to assume that like her like human body, you know, maybe, you know, she wasn't, she didn't really get to experience a lot of the feeling like, you know, she's kind of like, there's, there's some difference. It's going to like bum her out a little bit because she can't do magical things anymore. So she's going to, she's kind of going to go through like a period of, you know, maybe being a little needy, but not like in a bad way, but just in a way that like Sunny, you know, because she's given up like immortality and, Mm -hmm. you know, being able to, and her, and her family, you know, she's obviously very close to her sisters. Um, and I think it's, you know, it's just, And but she's living, you know, and being a waitress is like, you know, and a place like that is really a lot of work, I think. um, But really fun, like, you know, and she'll get into it because she's, you know, she's sunny and bubbly and stuff. And, you know, she has some wisdom from being, you know, around for um, many, 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 many uh, thousands of years. And I think for him, basically, he is there. He's going to hit the the logistics, as you said, of running a club. You know, there's, I mean, just keeping a nightclub staffed and keeping people from stealing money is like a a lot, you know, it's a headache. Um, Having people show up, having people like, you know, do the right amount of coke um, before their shift and during their shift and not too much. Um, You know, uh, all that stuff. Um, And then just, like, having to supply the place. And as you said, like, fountain maintenance, you know, finding the fountain maintenance guy. Um, However, I think they're going to be really – I do think they're going to be successful because I think that, like, 
roller skating is just taking off. They obviously this was abandoned, so perhaps like it was, you know, quite cheap to buy. I'm going to assume he bought the place and didn't rent it. So I don't know. That's what I'm thinking. Um, I think that essentially at some point, um, Danny is like, Sonny, you can't do that. Like, this is not the job for you. He's going to keep trying to, like, figure out his place in Xanadu. And he's going to use Xanadu as an excuse to not work on his art because I just get the feeling he likes the idea of being an artist more than doing the work of being an artist. And it's just going to kind of twist and embitter him. And I think that actually um, Kira is going to realize really quickly that, you know, this was not the right horse to bet on. Like, he's too bitter. I mean, he was never really, like, very engaging in the best of times. So I think once, you know, the kind of fun wears off, like, I think within a year, there's going to be a lot of fighting. She's going to be like, you're such a friggin' child. Um, And I think at some point, though, she's going to realize, I've been amused my whole life. Like, I've been amused. I've always done this for other people. But she's gotten to watch the creative process in such an intimate way. She's so familiar with it that she's going to realize, hey. So at first, I think she's going to like kind of stumble into being a manager for some new band because she'll give them ideas. She'll like sell, talk them up to somebody. And it'll be one of those things where suddenly you become the quote unquote manager. And then, you know, and then a little bit later when they start getting a little more successful like something happens and she starts to sing you know she like has to get up and maybe like do some backup singing or someone's sick something happens and she realizes this is actually this is what she loves she loves music and she's going to realize she has the ability to create music like she doesn't need to work through anybody else so I think that I, I guess I see her as like, so she starts out kind of poppy, but she's so eclectic and she's just so into trying all these different things. It's, I imagine her sort of doing like, you know, I don't know why I'm thinking Joni Mitchell. I'm just thinking that like Joni Mitchell was so uh, like created art in so many different ways. You know, she was a painter, she was a writer, you know, she did oh, okay. some writing and she didn't, and and, you know, at one point, like, you know, there's Joni Mitchell was talking about how she's like, yeah, I don't really see myself as a singer. I, I think of myself as a painter, you know, and it's like and but just that kind of level of uh, attention to detail and delight in process. Like and I think she's going to be really successful. Um, I think she's going to be one of those people that, um, you know, becomes really well respected um, but still, and still has commercial success, um, even in the eighties, but is uh, then kind of works on her own thing, um, which is kind of be a difficult thing to do in the eighties. Cause frankly, a lot of people who are really making, you know, kind of got eaten up by the synthesizer. But, um, I, I just think like, that's where she's going to go. Like, um, I think she's going to like surpass him. And I think, you know, I don't think she's ever going to find one person. I think it's going to be, you know, a string um, of people. She's very, you know, long relationships. She's like people she's very close to. I think she's going to have a lot of fun. Um, I imagine, you know, yeah, I just, I think she's going to stay in Los Angeles. Um, I think for him, basically, um, I think he's going to keep trying to like, he's going to build Xanadu, do all these things. He's uh, at some point, Danny's going to be like, you know what? I had a really good time. And the reason I'm rich is I know when to get out. And he's going to sell Xanadu at the height of like the roller skating thing. Just before everyone's sick of it and the whole like, right. So he's going to have money. He's going to share it with Sonny. Um. But and so Sonny suddenly is going to have all of this time to do his art. That's what he's so Danny's like, this is my gift to you. You now have time. I've given you money. You know, you have several years of runway 
to if you're careful, you have five years here. Do what you or whatever it is. I'm not doing the math right. Um, <laughs> that's why I'm not. Uh, and but the thing that he's going to realize is every morning he's going to wake up and he still hasn't, you know, he doesn't know what to do. And at the end of the day, he hasn't done his art and he's just going to become the guy in the coffee shop who like talks about his art and never does it or the guy in the bar. And I actually think that alcohol is going to play a part of this. And I think he's going to be one of those guys that goes from like, you know, then like, so then he'll like get a job managing some other nightclub and it'll just be managing worse and worse and worse nightclubs Hmm. and bars. Yes. Until he's like the embittered old man who every now and again likes to, you know, likes like, you know, just still talks to himself as an artist, even though he hasn't done any art. Hmm. I mean, that's not as bad as I thought you were going to do. <laughs> oh, God. I mean, that could have been a lot worse. True. Hmm. Okay. What about you, Diana? Well, uh, so I also am going to go after Sonny in a not positive way because that's mm. just, you know, again, he's not the biggest, you know, shining light in this particular movie. But allow me to put this into into the hopper. So she comes back. She's like the waitress. It's kind of like ambiguous you know, it, I mean, I, I was with you and I'm, I'm glad you brought it up that it's just like, wait, did she have her memory wiped? Does she need to start from scratch? Are they about to fall in love all over again? But I stick with the idea behind it that she is human now, but and she has her memories and she has all of these things here. But what I'm going to throw into the mix is she's not the muse anymore. She has some magic to her, but what she came down with is a complete opposite realm of the creative so guess who is going to be like a day trader and making a crap ton of money with her abilities not only is she able to be like on the financial element of like being able to make money you know talking about like danny and how he's like well i gave up the uh the clarinet now i'm in the construction because you know solid you know family business you know making money blah 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 with the kind of sadness of having to give up his art to you know have have uh, the stability or in this case beyond stability of just like freaking millions and millions of dollars but what i think is going to be part of kira's new life is her ability to not only be sustaining something like a nightclub but she's also able to just like fall into these you know quote unquote non-artistic pursuits and is able to make a lot of money and i see that being like a headbutting scenario between her and Sonny, because he's all about the art. And he just kind of wandered into this relationship with Danny, where it's just like, hey, come take half of this nightclub idea with me. It's a partnership. And I'm just like, where's my where's my bajillionaire guy saying, hey, man, you want to come be part of this like big venture of something that's going to be really exciting because I'm paying for all of it? Your half is you're here. OK, yes, I would like to take half your money. Good, sir. Thank you very much. Um, I would be into that. I would be into that. Uh, so, so not only is there going to be this kind of like awkwardness between Kira being able to do what she does, Sunny is going to get really resentful about it because she's managed to be successful and is happy about it. So he leaves her. He is too bitter about the money and he goes off and mm -hmm. the relationship is over and it's just, that's all there is. And so what's going to happen on the positive side. She'll be, she'll be very upset about it, but at the same time, she's not really looking per se for that relationship to be the whole of her. What's going to happen simultaneously is that because she's able to help basically fix the disaster that was the Xanadu water fountain and no revenue potential that I had witnessed, she's able to help turn that around. She has to spend a lot of time with Danny and I see them rekindling a relationship, not based off of what was in the 40s, but like what is now. And what's kind of cool that in my version is that her muse and her immortality, she's human now, but she was able to maintain something to where 
their rebutting relationship is able to create this sort of exchange that increases his life and in turn makes her kind of catch up with him. So that Mm. way, they're able to have the 40 years that were lost and they were able to continue it together. So they get Mm. that time back and then they finish it off together. And that's where my story is going to end. Sonny's gone. He didn't really have it. Turns out this was an opportunity for her to have that, which was missing with Danny. Wow. I like it. I just really like them better. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. yeah. If we Robin, could some... what do you think? Like, yeah, I love it. I do, too. Ah, thanks. It's really nice. I just want them together. Yeah. Magic. Deities. Magic. Yeah. Did. This was fun, though. <laughs> <laughs> So much fun. Weirdest movie ever. I'm looking through my notes to see if there's... Oh, the only thing we didn't talk about... Yeah. We can talk about briefly is, you know, when you watch a movie when you're a kid, Mm -hmm. and then when you watch it as an adult, I love... Well, I love rereading books because um, I miss the people, you know, in them. Mm -hmm. And I love rewatching movies, sometimes for the same thing, but often... And I do this with some books as well, but to... Uh, watch again from the vantage point of where you are and see how it changes because we often view our perception as kind of reality and very fixed, you know, and our judgments on things. And I love Mm -hmm. to see that shift over time. And it's also a reminder of how actually fluid some of the things that we take as solid are. Mm -hmm. And as a kid, I thought the boss was such a jerk. And like I said, I wasn't into Sunny, but I was like, yeah, stick it to the man. What a boring boss. And, you know, he should be able to make his art. And now I'm looking at him like he is a nightmare employee and the boss really isn't doing anything wrong. You know, if anything, he should just be firing him, not even give Mm -hmm. him a few minutes. He's letting himself get emotionally manipulated and riled up by his employee, which is ridiculous. But you have a guy in here who proudly says that he's last in, first out. He refuses to do his job properly, even though he's very good at it, you know, and technically strong. But it's like... He says he's, and it's such an arrogant move to say, well, I'm making their covers better. It's like, how about you come up with your own ideas? You know, we have a thing that we talk about with people we work at consulting side, like, are you a movie maker or are you a movie critic? Mm. You know, and there you have a lot of movie critics talking about other people's work and what they would do differently and how to make it better, but they're actually not producing anything of their own. And so Sonny is a classic movie critic to me, you know, and he's in there, you know, Fussing with everybody else's stuff and, you know, causing a ruckus, distracting the rest of the team. And that really stuck out to me, just the very, you know, completely different um, feelings that I had watching this dynamic from, you know, when I was a kid to um, when I was an adult. And if you had asked me as a kid or told me as a kid that I would identify (laughs) with that boss more than Sunny, I (laughs) totally do. And yeah. now, oh my God, I've become a nightmare. And I just, I love, I love that kind of experience where you watch the same thing and you just feel something completely different. Oh yeah. That's funny. I, yeah. Cause I did not remember any of the job scenes, but I remember that similar reaction that Robin was talking about. And one of the other things you know, to build on what you said, um, I was like, I was like, He's making a, he's a, like, the thing that's terrible about him is actually how he treats his coworkers with such disrespect of their time and their art. And they're trying so hard to, like, you know, reach out to him and, or they're trying so hard to, like, you know, like you're there, you're in, you know, it's probably like kind of an okay gig, you know, like. Tell him Tuesday's Wednesday. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's. And in this, like, yeah, the way that he is, and that's, like, the thing that would bother me the most if I were, you know, the, the, like, where I identify with the boss is, like, it's, like, just, you're creating a really huge morale problem with this person. Like, it's not (sighs) worth it to have the genius, the moody, mercurial genius when you can have somebody, you know, it's the whole, like, there's a lot of this in tech, like, the 10x engineer, you know? Like, is it really worth it to have, you know, one 10x engineer if it makes everybody else, like, if it pulls everybody else down, you know? Mm -hmm. And 
Yeah. So I, that like, it's so funny. Cause I, yeah, I had it's just none of that came up. None yeah. of it. Yeah. You know that you mentioned, it's just like, yeah, why do you get out of the one coworker where it's like, everyone's moving right along, getting right through it. Uh, Sonny's in. Oh, he's going to piss off the boss. Damn it. Yeah. Like, I have a headache and I just, I, you know, I really love doing, I love it when I get the paint, you know, like today I get to come in and I get to do the, like, I love it when I get to do the sunrises. Like, I don't know. I just really like it. Or like, I love it when I get to do this one artist, like it'll be a nice day. I'll have music on. It's sunny out and, oh, sunny has to bring me down. Boo. You know, anyway. Wow. Yeah. I'm glad that you mentioned that. Because that is something that comes up a lot with these, mm-hmm. you know, when you're rewatching movies, especially when you saw them when you were eight. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Like when I watched Mannequin. Yes. Mannequin. Okay. Wait. Now, I listen to the Mannequin podcast, but you're going to have to remind me. What was the switch for you? No, just like I remember watching this. I remember enjoying this. Oh, geez. He's, why is he running up the ranks so quickly? I, why is he vice president? <laughs> it's been two weeks. Is it because he pushed you out of the way of the sign? That that gets you like a box of chocolates, not a VP position. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I know. You're like, I'm boring now. <laughs> the 80s were about very accelerated timelines. Like you had the movies in the 50s that really freaked me out. There was one movie I saw, Madam X. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's Lana Turner in it. And, you know, she's got this great life. Her caudal Montalban's being a jerk. She pushes him down the stairs and it just sets off this cascade of events, you know. Mm. And for like, I watched that when I was like seven. I'm like, okay, lesson is be careful in every single thing you do or life could fall apart. And then you came to the 80s and it told you the opposite. It's like, you could just be walking down the street. Next thing you know, you're CEO. Like two weeks later, it felt like Mm -hmm. anything was possible. Right. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Completely. Yeah, I think oh. that may also have messed with me a little more, maybe than even the romantic thing. <laughs> it's like, you know, work like, yeah, and then I'll just become this, you know, I mean, I don't think I harbored that many of those fantasies, but I'm like, yeah, actually, <laughs> well, I think when I was especially younger, like in my 20s, I was like, why aren't I the, oh, wait, because I have to prove that I can like, you know learn the business before I Ugh, the business anyway. Plana. You're such business. A- I know I'm so freaking boring now. <laughs> awesome. Let's, let's keep it that way. Thank you. Awesome. Oh my God. I think we did it. We did it. Did it. Thank you so much, Robin, both for suggesting this movie, getting me to tell our origin story and having you there to like fill in the details that makes it a better story um (laughs) and thank you for just being an awesome friend and a great and a listener and a fantastic guest oh my god well thank you guys for having me i hope i did okay i've never done anything like this before so i'm thrilled to be here you did amazing it was great and i'm so excited i'm gonna cut that that part where you said i've never done like this before because you're awesome (laughs) (laughs) well thank you guys for having me this has been fantastic oh i'm so glad you had fun yeah, this was this was wonderful. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, and you know what? We got to hear what Robin thought about Xanadu, but mm-hmm. I think our listeners need to tell us what they think about oh, Xanadu. Please, I want everything. Yeah, what are your favorite details? What What's your favorite jumpsuit? Any of it. <laughs> okay. Where do you fall on, you know, what are your opinions about tray size and shape? All right, well, how about this? If they have jumpsuit photos that they want to do, they can get us on Instagram, but we're also on Twitter, both at HemeCast. H-E-A-M-C-A-S-T. We're on Facebook at Happily Ever Aftermath. Please uh, like us there. And, uh, you know, Polina really wants to hear your thoughts. Okay, so send us all your thoughts. Send us your photos of the jumpsuits at um, our email, contact at Mm -hmm. Um, If you are so inclined, if you leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or even on Facebook, you know, uh, it helps other people find the show. We'd appreciate that. Tell a friend. Find your Robin in your life and tell them (laughs) about this podcast. Please. That's totally awesome. Please give them, yeah. Yeah. So, okay, Polina. Mm-hmm. Next time. 
So this is an uh, this episode has been years in the making. Um, I, uh, I you may remember our um, our clip show. Well, I don't have to remember. We had a clip show many years ago about um, Tit- uh, the movie Titanic, which is basically like what role did Titanic play in your life? Where we asked at. Um, uh, the LA Podcast Festival, we asked um, a, a bunch of amazing people that question because it seemed really um, fruitful. Um, and, but actually Titanic uh, was a big part of when we, you know, first started kind of coming up with this podcast, we always kind of had a lot of jokes about like, was it weird? We're like people who aren't really into romantic movies and yet we have a podcast about romantic movies. Um and we kind of always used Titanic as the uh, as kind of a, kind of I guess a touchstone for um, the kind of things we didn't like. But um, I thought it would be really fun if we did Titanic. Um, right, uh, Titanic. And uh, and kind of explored that 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 sort of internal <laughs> running joke. <laughs> Robin's laughing. I can see her on the Skype call. Um, but and so anyway, we're gonna do Titanic, uh, the 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 like er romantic movie um, of uh, the '90s, and uh, we are gonna have our esteemed producer. Uh, Ryan join us because uh, this uh, featured prominently in in his life too, which is also always fascinating me. So, yeah, that's going to be our movie, Diana. Uh, <laughs> did you appreciate? Plans? Well, did you appreciate that I played you off? <laughs> yes, I really do. I really appreciated that you played me off. I was like, I was really, I was reaching there. Um, oh my goodness. Anyway, uh, so, yeah, so please join us next time. <laughs> Robin just did a heart. <laughs> um, we yeah, got so we're going to be doing Titanic. And so uh, please, please prepare yourself for an amazing episode. Alrighty. Until then. Until then. Bye.